<laughs> okay, welcome everyone. So I'd like to introduce Daniel. Do you say Himmelstein or Himmelstein? I say usually Himmelstein, but my, my dad says Himmelstein. Oh, so, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, Daniel Himmelstein. <laughs> and these uh, are largely our data science summer camp students. Variety of people. We've got people visiting from Argentina, from South Korea, and then some locals. And uh, a lot of clinicians in the audience. Uh, some people who are doing research, some people who work for industry. So it's a, a broad, diverse audience. And so Daniel is a postdoc at the University of Pennsylvania. And I went there and gave a talk about a month ago and met him. And he said he was coming to Utah and what should he do while he's here? And I said, well, you should come give a talk. <laughs> That's what you should do and go mountain biking. Yeah, so I'll do the talk. We've gone mountain running and uh, hopefully we'll get to mountain biking soon. Yes. So yeah, thanks so much. All right, and I hope you'll introduce yourself in a little more detail about your background. Or... OK, yeah, I will. Um, Thanks for that introduction. Thanks for having me here. I, it's exciting to talk to students who are going to be doing a lot of uh, data science going forward. It's one of my passions, and um, I hope to inspire good computational practices. Uh, mm -hmm. And feel free to ask questions uh, throughout, even if you think they're off topic. So I'm going to talk about uh, today uh, het nets and open science and um, I'll tell you about them when I get to that. Uh, so I'm a postdoc in the Green Lab at the University of Pennsylvania. I think we may currently have open postdoc positions if uh, you're a grad student that's graduating soon. I did my PhD at the University of California, San Francisco in biological and medical informatics. And um, yeah, I'm uh, kind of wrapping up my postdoc now, so looking for opportunities in the next year or two, maybe start my own lab. And a special thanks that I want to give to a few people who helped with some of the unpublished work that I'm going to present on. Uh, Vince Rubinetti, our front-end developer, Michael Zietz, an undergraduate, and Casey Green, my current advisor, and then all the online collaborators we have on our open source software, um, which I'll talk about. So when I started my PhD, it was 2011, and I was generally interested in networks. And I want to kind of give you an example of, of why I was interested in networks. This is my Facebook friendship graph. So every node here, uh, every dot, is a Facebook user that I was friends with. And they're connected if uh, they're friends with each other. So it's like a graph of mutual friendships on Facebook. And the larger nodes are, um, ha have more edges. They have a higher degree, meaning that they have more mutual friends, essentially, uh, with me. And the network only contains the nodes and edges, or the users and the friendships. It doesn't contain any information about um, sort of where I met them uh, or how I know them. It sort of has to infer that. And um, we inferred it using two techniques here. Uh, the first is applying a layout. So that uh, put like the nodes that had a lot of connections close together. and. Um, the second was a community detection algorithm, which is how the um, users are colored. So what you can see is that um, my friends were grouped into a bunch of groups. So for example, over here, these were all uh, people I went to college at Cornell with. I was on the debate team there, and I, I guess the community detection algorithm has identified that the debate team was a bit socially isolated, which is why it separated it out. Um, <laughs> I also thought it was interesting, my mom has a lot of siblings, like 15, and um, this sort of cluster here was all our family very far apart because it didn't have many other, it had a lot of connections with itself, but not outside of that. Uh, so this got me interested in networks, and I wanted to apply some of these concepts to biology, but I thought this really is having a single node type, uh, like just users, or and a single relationship type was too simple for biology. Uh, in biology, you have a lot of different things. You have genes, diseases, pathways, side effects, etc. cetera. Uh, and you have a lot of relationships. Sometimes you have multiple relationships between uh, the same types of nodes. For example, genes can have protein interactions with each other, or genes can um, you know, be regulators of other genes. So I thought uh, the existing networks were too simple. 
And so we needed networks with multiple node relationship types. And at that time, and still to this day, these networks are being researched, but they're being researched in a lot of different disciplines, and there's not a great consistent terminology. A 2012 study actually identified 26 different names that uh, these networks sometimes go by. And um, so I wanted to pick a name that could give rise to a field of study, and when you have 26 different terms or something, what do you do? You invent a 27th. So. <laughs> I, um, I call these networks multiple node relationship types HETNES. And actually, it's not totally invented because there's this existing term, heterogeneous network or heterogeneous information network, and I just wanted something a little bit more catchy. Uh, so that's what I mean by HETNET if I say it. <coughs> and so here's the layout of the HETNET that uh, we designed during my PhD. Uh, the, this is the graph of types. So it's not showing the specific nodes in the network, but it's just showing what types of nodes there are and how those types of nodes can be connected. So for example, we have compounds. These are your small molecule compounds like um, you know, things you would get from a pharmacy. Uh, we have uh, diseases and then you can imagine different types of connections between compounds and diseases. For example, a compound can treat a disease um, or a compound can palliate a disease which means it addresses the symptoms but maybe not the underlying biology of that disease. Um, so this was a big task at data integration and taking a lot of public data sets and putting them together. Uh, probably a lot of you may be familiar with some of these data sets. So uh, for example, for the compound uh, binding to a gene slash protein, that would come from resources like Drug Central and Drug Bank. Um, for the compound upregulates or downregulates a gene, that would come from uh, the Lynx L1000 resource. Uh, so we had to put a lot of things together. I guess if people are doing data integration, a few pieces of advice are always to use standardized terminologies for the nodes uh, so that everything merges up nicely. Um, and to do stuff in a versioned way. So you know, if something changes, you know why. Uh, and this was kind of a big task, putting together all these databases, we, we happened to put together 29, and I was just kind of like, you know, in the middle of my PhD, I didn't know much about a lot of these resources, so what I did is um, sort of started a discussion forum where we invited people uh, to discuss with us um, online the resources and how we should best analyze these resources. So that started in uh, 2015, and as you can see, you know, uh, I'm this bottom line, a lot of the initial comments were me, but uh, as time went on, more and more users joined and we got this large corpus of body or, or of content on how we should process these resources. And that was very helpful, uh, since I didn't know a lot of things, to sort of reach out to the creators of a lot of these resources. Uh, and this motivated me going forward to try to do all of my science publicly and with a lot of feedback with the larger community. So when the network was all constructed, it looked like this. This is like a bird's eye view where each node is a tiny little dot. They're all lined up so you can't act like there's a bunch of dots in a line and that makes, um, that, that's the compounds. Or all the genes are tiny little dots and they make a big circle. Uh, so you can see where the connections are. Uh, so, so this is HetiNet version 1.0. It's a HetNet of biology for drug repurposing. And it had 50,000 nodes of 11 types and uh, 2 million relationships of 24 types. And uh, it put together knowledge from millions of studies from these 29 uh, public resources. And I thought I put in a list of what those resources are, but I guess I didn't put that slide here. Um, <laughs> So if you want to access this network, we host a public Neo4j instance, uh, where, which you can go to and uh, do queries. So one exciting thing about that is if you learn the Cypher query language, which is a bit like SQL, uh, you can start asking complex questions really quickly. So uh, here we want to ask, how could multiple sclerosis, which is a disease, uh, affect retinal layer formation, which is like a, a gene ontology biological process? Uh, so here we specify a type of path where a disease associates with a gene uh, which interacts with another gene which participates in the biological process. And we say the disease should be multiple sclerosis 
and the bilateral <coughs> process should be read in a layer formation. And then uh, we say that the, this first edge here, this association edge, should have GWAS evidence, uh, so genome-wide association studies um, showing that the that, that edge exists. And uh, we want to make sure that um, this second gene here is upregulated in anatomies or tissues that multiple sclerosis affects. So it's kind of a, it requires putting together a lot of data, and before we have this network, it could take us months of sort of wrangling these data sets to get an answer here. <coughs> But now that we have it, we can run this query and it returns essentially instantly, uh, showing the different ways you can go from multiple sclerosis to retinal layer formation. Uh, so if you're interested in this, uh, please query the database and, um, yeah. Any questions? So we made the database and then we wanted to apply it and we decided to apply it for drug repurposing which is the idea of whether we can find new uses for existing <coughs> drugs. Uh, so the network contained about 1,500 compounds <coughs> and 130 diseases. So if you do the math, there's over 200,000 compound disease pairs. Of those 200,000, actually 755 were known treatments. Uh, and these treatments we had physicians go through and curate. Uh, so we had three physicians go through because uh, where we were getting the data, it's sometimes hard. They would call like maybe a symptomatic drug a treatment and we'd want to remove that. Uh, so we were looking for really disease modifying treatments. Uh, and um, so you can imagine if, if there's about 700 we know about and 200,000 possible treatments, um, you know, there's a lot of potential treatments that we don't know about and we want to be able to pre predict what those ones are. Uh, so we call this approach systematic drug repurposing, where we want to compare the utility of the different data types we put in. We want to identify the mechanisms of how drugs work across, like, you know, all drugs. And then uh, for each of these compound disease pairs, we want to predict the probability that it's a, a valid treatment. So how did this approach work? Uh, it was a supervised machine learning problem, which meant that we had to go from the network to features uh, that describe the relationship between a compound and disease. And so we'll go over how we, we do that. Um, here, each observation, or each sort of row, is a compound disease pair. So for example, this top one is calcitriol and dilated cardiomyopathy. And here we have like cimetidine and obesity. And, um, some of these are treatments, so here all the compound disease pairs on the bottom are actual known treatments. Um, if any of you are obesity experts, apparently this is like a false classification, smetidine, so um, yeah. But anyways, our, our features are types of paths. Um, so, so really the goal here is to be able to find patterns that uh, show how these treatments are different from the non-treatments. And the patterns are with these features. And what each feature is, is a certain way you can get from compound to disease in the network, a certain type of path. Yeah? So the non-treatments, are yes. those validated non-treatments or they're just randomly selected pairs? Um, they're all non-treatments. Okay. Um, and it was really, it's hard to compile good negative sets mm -hmm. in these domains. Uh, but we think it's a you know, it's a reasonable assumption that, like, the non-treatments or things that aren't known to be treatments will, in general, be more negative than the positives. And the, uh, the algorithms that we use for machine learning don't actually need the negatives to be perfect. They just need them to be more negative than the positive. Okay. <laughs> if that, um, yeah, I think it's something people run into a lot. And, and one point I would say is, um, I think it's nice to maintain, like, the imbalance when you're doing the machine learning. Um, so if you have a lot more negatives, you know, keep more negatives such that your predictions are scaled to the actual problem domain. Um, and that's something we did, although this example shows a balanced data set. But in reality, it was very unbalanced. Uh, so this first feature measures uh, how many of a certain type of path there were, and that type of path is when a compound binds to a gene that associates with the disease. 
And you can see here in red, uh, that indicates a lot of those paths were identified in the network. So midazolam uh, binds to many genes which are associated with epilepsy. Uh, here's another feature, uh, which is when a compound binds to a gene that interacts with another gene that associates with the disease. And uh, here you can see the patterns are a little bit different. And so we ended up doing this for actually 1,200 different types of paths, all paths up to lane 4 that can go from a compound <coughs> to a disease. And each path essentially signifies something different about how a compound and disease can be related. And um, what you start to see here is certain patterns emerge where the treatments are higher in certain, prefer in certain features than the non-treatments. And um, that's how essentially we use like a regularized logistic regression model. Um, but any, any classifier can really pick up on these patterns and, and use it to predict the probability that a new compound disease pair is a treatment. Uh, so this is when we, we made our predictions and then we applied them and we saw how they worked on existing uh, treatments and we saw that they performed very well. Um, area under the ROC curve is a measure of, uh, it, it's essentially the, it's not essentially, it is <laughs> uh, the probability that a randomly selected positive will be ranked higher than a randomly selected negative. Um, so the most you can get is 100%. If you get 50%, your classifier is no better than random. Um, if you get way below 50%, you should probably just invert your classification. Um, anyways, uh, so we did well, but the question was, would this really apply to things we know less? Um, potentially, like if we were looking for uh, future treatments that, that aren't discovered yet. So we saw how we performed on treatments that are currently undergoing clinical trials. And uh, while our performance wasn't as good, it was still much better than random, indicating that approaches like this <coughs> can be helpful in prioritizing potential drug repurposing studies. So if you have maybe 100 potential leads or um, repurposable drugs, you know, which one should you focus on? And um, so next we want to say why you should focus on certain ones uh, so it's not a black box. Um, this slide is about seeing how important each piece of information is, uh, each type of edge. I'm going to skip over it because it gets very technical, but if people are interested, talk to me later. Um, I, I guess in short, we found that the, what had been traditionally considered by pharmacologists like um, information like what compounds treat what disease is, what pharmacologic classes compounds are in, those were very predictive. Um, a little bit less predictive are things that have been traditionally used in biomedicine, but newer for drug efficacy. And then still predictive, but less predictive were all these high throughput data sources coming out, like um, whether a compound upregulates a gene. Uh, however, these maybe would provide more novel predictions, so we'd say they're still interesting. Um, and so we put all our predictions online. So you can go browse for the diseases we have. Um, and so, for example, uh, here we're looking at predictions for nicotine dependence or drugs that could help with smoking cessation. One point I want to make is sometimes we don't capture directionality perfectly. So the top prediction for um, helping with nicotine dependence was nicotine. <laughs> but, you know, probably you wouldn't want that. Well, maybe you would. I guess it's like the nicotine patch kind of is that. But um, the point is that I think our top predictions oftentimes um, are going to affect the disease, but you should probably follow up to make sure they affect it in the right direction. Um, but now I'm going to uh, just give a little example. One of our top predictions for nicotine dependence is bupropion, which um, was first approved for depression in 1985. And then during the clinical trials, they noticed that uh, patients who were taking it for depression wanted to smoke less. And actually a lot of, you know, um, effects of drugs are discovered this way. It's really through serendipity or just uh, chance observation where you're lucky, but you need big sample sizes and, you know, you need to have a lot of patients actually in the right setting to observe it. Uh, so kind of our goal is to make it to know this stuff before having to, to see it in patients. Um, 
But anyways, uh, so bupropion uh, was then researched and uh, for smoking cessation and in 97 approved by the FDA. So could we predict this from Hedionet? And as I showed you, it was a high prediction. And our method tells you what network paths um, we think are the most important. Uh, so for example here, um, it found that bupropion causes terminal insomnia, which is a side effect. Now that's not when you die because you can't sleep, but it's when um, you fall asleep fine and wake up in the middle of the night and then can't go back to bed. Uh, and that's also caused by varenicline, which is another FDA-approved nicotine-dependence treatment. So what's cool here is this is a, a sort of rare side effect, and it probably points to the common mechanism of action of varenicline and bupropion, such that uh, even if we didn't know the targets, because a lot of times our knowledge of targets is somewhat incomplete, we can start to infer things about the action from, from shared side effects. Uh, the method also found that bupropion binds to the CHRNA3 gene, which w is bound by varenicline. Uh, so they have uh, essentially common drug targets. This gene has a GWAS association with um, nicotine dependence, and it also participates in uh, many pathways where other nicotine dependence genes are involved. So this is how our method gives you an explanation for why it thinks there could be <coughs> efficacy. So, kind of, this has been cool, but it really required us to have these known treatments that we use as a gold standard to train the method. So gold standard here means um, kind of known knowledge that you can say, we know these node pairs are related, and therefore we're going to, um, you know, train a model to find other node pairs that are related. But in a lot of problems, in a lot of domains, you don't have these gold standards. A lot of people want to ask, how are two nodes related, and they don't want to provide uh, you know, thousands of other pairs of nodes that are related just to be able to, to train a model. So we're working now on connectivity search to show how two nodes are connected without having um, to, to provide any other information. And so uh, to, this has been a large part of my postdoc, and we've had to uh, create a, a sort of lot of software. It's been computationally challenging. Uh, one of them is this HEPMAP package, which is a Python 3 package that um, does some of these network traversals using matrix multiplication, which can, is a great optimization and has other optimizations like caching and, um, yeah, optimizations are great. <laughs> uh, and so this is what the prototype looks like. It's online at het.io slash search. And uh, for example, what you can do is uh, type in um, a node of any type. Here, let's just type in metformin, which is a compound, and then let's uh, look for breast cancer. And now I should say we're still kind of tweaking the algorithms here, so don't expect the results to be stable. It's, <laughs> we should probably put that as like pre-alpha somewhere on the uh, website. But anyways, um, the method has found um, several different types of paths here. So for example, this top path is a compound binds genes that it expresses in an anatomy that localizes the disease. Uh, and essentially what it's done is it found that there's more of this type of path than you would expect, so just given the number of edges that uh, metformin and breast cancer have. Uh, so if you go show more, you actually see all this extra sort of statistical information, which is what's called the null distribution. So for each of these values, for each of these um, numbers of paths connecting the compound and disease, or the two nodes, we've made a null distribution, such that when you see the actual value, you can say this is more than we'd expect um, by essentially random chance. And so you can click on, um, you know, to find all the paths of, of that type of path, and then we can visualize them below here. Uh, so, for example, uh, it's showing the connections between metformin and breast cancer. And unlike the previous graphs I showed you, we didn't have to, uh, you know, train this in any way. You didn't have to give it known treatments, and it was able to detect this information. Uh, so, one thing it's finding is that metformin um, 
binds to the protein this N of this ND6 gene, which is uh, NADH dehydrogenase, and uh, that interacts with N NDU, uh, which is associated with breast cancer. It also finds that metformin treats other diseases that affect similar tissues to breast cancer. And so, so why is that interesting? Um, here's a quote, metformin is the most widely used antibiotic drug in the world, and there is increasing evidence of a potential efficacy of this agent as an anti-cancer drug. First epidemiological study showed decreasing cancer incidence in metformin treated patients. And so that was in 2010, but the mechanisms were largely unknown. In 2014, a study came out that said, we report that in human cancer cells, metformin inhibits mitochondrial complex one and IDH dehydrogenase activity in cellular respiration. Uh, so 2014 is kind of around where um, the data cutoff was for our network. And so you could see around the same time as the study, we would also identify um, <coughs> this same sort of protein as potentially being involved in the uh, relationship between metformin and cancer. Now, obviously, when we give you back a graph, it's not the same level of certainty. Uh, you need follow-up investigation like this, but it can help tell you where to look, especially um, if you're going to a subject where you don't know a ton about, or say uh, you're using EHR records or epidemiological studies, to generate a lot of hypotheses or potential uh, leads, it can really be helpful to have a tool like this um, to, to check if, if there's any you know, possible connectivity. Okay, so now I'm going to segue to a completely different study I did during my PhD as um, a little side project uh, with my roommate and colleague at the time. Yes? Sorry, can I ask one? Yeah, let's do one. the... Um, is your tool able to query, like you said that this is a, a drug repurposing project. Yeah. Um, are you able to just query in general, say, like across, across the board, which drugs have the strongest associations with <coughs> certain diseases that are not within your data set of known links? Um, so there's like 130 diseases in the network. There's 1,500 compounds. For any pair of compound and disease in the network, we could give you a result um, of what we think the connections are and we could give you a score. Uh, but we couldn't give you a score for a disease not in the network. Uh, so this is not great for like rare diseases. Um, it's not great for <coughs> unapproved compounds or like investigational compounds. And one reason we didn't include those is kind of in the network sense, if you don't have many connections, you, you, you know, we can't the network only knows as much about a node as its connections. And um, we would like to put in a lot of um, these sort of newer drugs or these rare diseases, um, but we would need data sets with, you know, that can provide more information on them. And it seems like your system uh, would be readily extended to search for uh, new uh, adverse drug events. Yes. Um, I think it definitely could be. Um, have, you, have you explored that? No, so basically any pairs of, any two node types that are in the network, you know, we could apply the approach to, and I, I think, you know, that may be one application going forward. Um, you know, we're always interested in exploring more things. It's, I guess, just a matter of time and, and subject experts. So, just to make sure I understand it correctly, if I, let's say I were a um, lung cancer expert. Yes. I could search on lung cancer and get all the compounds that have edges pointing to lung cancer, rank them by their probability of occurring, and maybe have some hypotheses of what I might explore. Exactly. Um, so that would be... <laughs> so if we go here, we can... Um, put in lung cancer, and then uh, here are the, the top predictions. So a lot of the top predictions are the actual known disease-modifying treatments. Um, and then, you know, uh, do you have any interest? Uh, we have the number of trials, so like a lot of these actually are already investigated in trials. Um, and then you could, say, click on this and it launches something in the database which will 
allow you to see the different paths from the drug. To the, this is the top 10 paths that have found is important. Um, but this is on the old supervised approach. You could still do something similar with the new connectivity search as well. Um, So yes, this was a study that and I haven't talked about it in a few years besides yesterday at the Cancer Center. And uh, one reason I want to talk about it is because we're in Salt Lake City, which is um, at a, a great elevation of 1,200 meters. And I think Sam and I were definitely feeling it on our run into the hills this morning. <laughs> but uh, so, uh, so, so my colleague at the time was, was very interested in uh, cancer rates, and he looked at a lot of maps and. Um, the lung cancer incidence is, uh, chart is pretty interesting. So this shows counties, and what you notice is in the West Coast, lung cancer rates tend to be a, a little bit less. Um, and uh, so incidence means the number of essentially people per year who uh, develop lung cancer. And uh, we were interested in elevations for reasons I'll get to, but uh, the West Coast has great elevation variation, and essentially the different elevations people live at is like a natural dosing gradient. So the experiment has kind of been done for us of you know what happens to people who live at different elevations in their cancer rates. Uh, so we looked at counties in the Western United States, and if you just look at uh, elevation here, which is on the x-axis versus lung cancer incidence, you see that on the county level there's actually um, quite a strong correlation, um, where at higher elevations, there's less lung cancer. And this is before adjusting for any va variables, like probably the most important one here is smoking, obviously, um, but, but other potential variables. But um, just visualizing these two variables, uh, you see that there is this negative association. And uh, here is Salt Lake, Utah, the county. You'll notice that it actually falls quite below the, the uh, trend line here. And um, a model we end up fitting would um, show us that it's actually because there's a low smoking rate um, here. So I think that's interesting. But, uh, so that plot I showed you shows the correlation between elevation and lung cancer. And in this plot, we uh, show negative correlation in these blues, and positive will be in the red. Um, so that Correlation we just saw translates to this value here. Um, we collected a bunch of other variables, demographic variables, environmental variables, uh, health variables, to tell other things about the populations in the counties. And so, for example, you can see with lung cancer here, some of the variables are positively correlated, some are negatively correlated. What I think is important to realize in epidemiology is every variable is correlated with every variable. Um, so the finesse is really being able to, to see which correlations are potentially more causal and, and directly related. Um, so here you have the sort of um, covariates or other variables that we collected for counties and, and how they correlate with themselves. And then we looked at uh, three other cancers besides lung cancer, and these were chosen because they're the most common cancers uh, which have the most data available because um, they're common. And so what we did is we fit a bunch of models where we required that the elevation was in the model, but we let um, the model contain any of the other variables that, that we had included. And what you see for lung cancer is um, regardless of what the other variables the model chose and, and how many other variables the model chose, the uh, relationship between elevation and lung cancer was always quite negative. Uh, so this is, I believe, a 99% confidence interval. Um, so, so essentially, this is quite a large effect size. Um, now, for breast cancer, uh, if you didn't include any other variables, it, it did look like elevation had a negative um, association. But as soon as you started including other variables, that negative association was really reduced with breast cancer. And, um, colorectal cancer, a similar story where, where there's you know, no consistent picture uh, and same with prostate cancer. 
Uh, so our hypothesis is that um, the most likely culprit here is oxygen. And uh, relative to sea level, there's 89% less oxygen on 1,000 meters. Um, 70, sorry, not less, 78% of the oxygen. <laughs> if you're at 2,000 meters, right. you're breathing 78% of the oxygen because the air pressure is less, essentially. Um, and at 3,000 meters, it's um, you know, about 30% less oxygen that you're breathing. And uh, I guess you know, some people thought this was crazy. They were like, well, what, breathing kills you? But um, actually, there's, uh, I mean, considerable evidence from <coughs> different models and different past experiments. This study from 2011 is titled Ambient Oxygen Promotes Tumor Genesis. And I'm not sure if you've seen this Twitter account, but it goes and retweets things and then it news stories and it adds in mice. So I feel like this title should have in mice. Then <laughs> <laughs> you kind of, uh, in, in your previous slide, you, you showed the correlation between sea level and other variables. What did it, what did it correlate with? I kind of missed. Oh, oh. Um, you want to see what elevation yeah, yeah, yeah. correlates with. So ele elevation correlates with um, most environmental variables. So I guess you have to look at this column here and that, or this row, yeah, and this column. I, I, I show so, the slide again in a bit. Yeah. Okay, because so I would have expected that you'd get some uh, uh, fairly strong negative correlation with particulate matter. Particulate matter is air pollution. Yes. I assume. I mean, uh, um, so I, I think probably like air pollution is bad, and if you have an individual level study, you can start to see that it is a, a carcinogen, uh, and it does cause lung cancer, but. I think like the percent of lung cancer cases that are caused by air pollution is still relatively small. And when you're looking at the county level, um, you're, not, you're not seeing a huge effect. I, I think we did see a, a slight positive correlation some, in some models when we had accounted for all the variables. True. Um, yeah. Thanks. So uh, in this experiment, they had these mice, which essentially are very predisposed to getting tumors, and uh, about half the mice, they kept at 20% oxygen, which is like you know uh, the levels humans are normally at, and then some of them, they, they uh, kept them at 10% oxygen, and they measured the time until they developed a tumor. And you can see that uh, the mice kept in lower oxygen chambers, uh, you know, didn't develop their tumors for longer. Uh, so, so kind of, I think looking at effect size is always very important. Um, we did a little funny thought experiment. So the highest county in the U.S. is San Juan County in Colorado at 3,400 meters. Uh, it has 35% less oxygen than the sea level. And we estimated that if the entire population of the U.S. were to essentially live at that elevation, I mean, obviously that's not realistic, <laughs> but if they were, um, you know, the effect our model was finding was that there could be 65,000 fewer lung cancer cases per year. And just to give you a benchmark, there's about uh, 230,000 in the U.S. per year new cases. Um, so, I, yeah, it, it's uh, smoking was a little bit larger of an effect at the county level, um, but it, you know, elevation was the second biggest effect beyond smoking. Now. If you went to like the East Coast where there's not elevation variation, um, you know that that yeah you wouldn't really see the same thing. But just because there's not really significant elevation variation or substantial. So, anyways, we we published this study, um, and it was controversial. This science journalist <laughs> oh said this God. is a, a really strong early contender for worst study of 2015, um, and, and Cancer Research UK, which is like the biggest cancer. Uh, charity thing in, in uh, the UK wrote this sort of blog post which is very negative but I don't think they actually gave a fair assessment of our study I mean responded here um, but you know n not everyone disliked it um, a reporter for the New York Times looked into it for like several months and, and wrote a nice story and I, I love the cover art with the trees as the lungs <laughs> and uh, says um, did, did you ever talk to Ed Wong? No, no. Uh, I saw him talk at Penn after that, but yeah, um, I'm not. He probably doesn't remember it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, he tweets a lot. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, it also won uh, at Penn this uh, basic research paper prize of the Cancer Center. So, um, so back to the plot uh, of all these variables. Uh, you know, one reason I think this is important um, is that if you're doing epidemiological studies that include lung cancer, I think you should include a, a elevation covariate. Uh, because including the covariate can help you assess your other variables better. Uh, and this is kind of a general thing. You want to have variables that, that are as close to the source or causal effects as possible. And once you do that, you can get better estimates for the variables you're interested in. And um, what's an interesting thing is that notice that lung cancer has a negative correlation with radon. Um, now, probably most <laughs> Physicians would say that radon is a risk factor for um, lung cancer, and there's good individual level data supporting that it is, um, you know, somewhat of a risk factor, not of a huge effect, but, but of a, you know, an effect that you don't want radon in your home. Um, but there has been this negative correlation between radon, so the more radon, the less lung cancer on a county level. And um, there's been a, a group of sort of fringe scientists who have said this is evidence for the hormesis theory where uh, low doses of radiation are actually protective of cancer. And I think it's a largely debunked theory, but um, this evidence they kept coming back to that there's this association or negative association between radon and lung cancer. But um, what I think they weren't considering is that radon is very positively associated with elevation here. Uh, so, for example, if we looked at the association between radon and lung cancer, and, and those were the only two models, or I think smoking was probably in here, um, it was extremely significant. It would lead you to believe maybe that there was this association. But as soon as we put elevation into the model, uh, that association essentially was reduced to, to zero. Um, well, in, you know, there's some, yeah. <clears throat> now, similar things happened with UVB. Uh, where it seems to have an association, and you know there have also been public studies published on U how UVB is so protective for lung cancer. What's UVB? Ah, uh, sorry, ultraviolet B radiation. Okay. Um, so you probably get a lot here, actually. <laughs> <laughs> what is the reason why elevation is uh, positively associated with radon? Um, I don't actually know, but maybe it just has to do something with the terrain. But I, 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 I can't speak to that, but, yeah. Um. Well, well, never mind. Okay, I'll say something that's like, yeah. I know nothing about this, except that I, one tiny thing, <laughs> that the ground level of radiation in Colorado is higher than the level that everyone freaks out about, about like nuclear power plant waste. Wow. It's just okay. what's coming out of the ground naturally. Yeah. Um. No, no, that is very interesting, yeah. Maybe it's related. Yeah, I'm not, is, that, is radon the amount that... I don't know. I, I don't know. Yeah, we need that. <laughs> but maybe. Our, um, our current front-end developer in the lab used to work in a nuclear power plant, so I'll have to ask him yeah, when I get back. <laughs> so the next um, thing I want to talk about is a product called Manibot, which is something hopefully you could all use uh, to write your next manuscript. And... What it is is a workflow and set of tools for scholarly publishing. Um, what you do is you write your manuscript in Markdown. Uh, if you have used Markdown, it's like a way of writing plain text that has uh, some basic info that supports basic styling, like having links, uh, headings, um, citations, and then it, it's processed and um, automatically converted to HTML, PDF, documents, and then um, your manuscript gets deployed automatically to like a web page whenever you make a change. So it, it tries to bring kind of a lot of the workflow of open source software development, like the workflow that's used to make Python and um, your favorite package, and it tries to apply it to writing um, manuscripts. And sort of one cool thing about that is that you can have many people working on the same document at once. Um, so it's based on the um, Git version control system, which is a way of like managing uh, text files mostly, and um, sites like GitHub or GitLab allow a lot of people to collaborate. So it is a bit technical, but if you're already doing these skills, 
um, and you're already using these things, you may decide that you want to write your paper this way. Um, Does it support ePublic e format? So it uses something called Pandoc to convert between the formats. And Pandoc is like the Swiss Army knife of document conversion. And that can output EPUB. Now, it's not like we don't officially support it, so we don't check that all of the conversions will work properly. Um, but you should be able to get a pretty good output to, to the EPUB. Um, are you thinking of it for like like books? Yeah. Yeah. Well, and because they're very accessible documents. Yeah. Um, we should look into that. I mean, I think it could work pretty well. Um, but the, the primary output is HTML. We really want to move beyond the PDF. And uh, this is what the HTML looks like. Uh, so this is a paper about Manubot written with Manubot. Uh, very meta. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, it has like tables and figures. And um, the figures can do cool stuff. And so how this project got started was with something called the Deep Review, which was a review article on deep learning in precision medicine. And we wanted to write it openly using GitHub. We kind of just invited anyone to um, write online with us. And we didn't actually really have a complete solution of how we were going to have them write and then convert it to a document. So we kind of built it when we were doing this. But at the end, uh, 27 different authors from 20 different institutions <laughs> contributed sections. Uh, it was the most viewed bioarchive preprint of 2017. You can see over time how the different people contributed. And I think one of the reasons why it was so popular was we were able to capture a lot of different knowledge on this rapidly evolving topic. Um, and for some topics, it really helps if you can you know, really let anyone in the world write. Because you know, there's experts, and they're going to be all over. And, um, a lot of the traditional methods don't scale like that. Uh, so one thing that Manubot uses is citation by persistent identifier. And that's the idea that the only manual step when making your bibliography is choosing which paper to cite. And the rest can be automated. And you just put in an ID for the paper. So here, this is a sentence with five citations. And each of these citations points to an ID for a study. Um, and these IDs can be like. DOIs. DOIs are digital object identifiers. You probably see them on the um, on, on some manuscripts you're reading. So for example, this one you say first that it's a DOI and then you give the DOI. Uh, or they can be PubMed IDs. Uh, so here uh, there are two different types of PubMed IDs. Uh, for example, they can also be archive IDs and URLs or increasingly supporting more and more identifier types. And sort of, so if you write this in a markdown file, um, your, your manuscript will contain a sentence like this, you know, where they've been converted to numbers or whatever style you want, actually. And then the references will look like this. And all that data was pulled from these resources. So you don't have to use a reference manager anymore. Um, yeah, hopefully you don't have to correct them, although sometimes if there's mistakes, we still have a way that you can um, you know, manually specify the data. And it uses something called CSL which like thousands of journals already have these styles. So if you want to go, if you know, say your paper got rejected, I'm sorry, and then if you need to submit to a new journal, you can just switch you know, one URL and it'll uh, remake it with a totally different style. Um, now, <laughs> it's, uh, there's this, not all the feedback is positive. This uh, Twitter commentator says, I love the idea, but for now, Manubot feels like compiling a Linux kernel in the early 90s. It might work, but only after several failures, a lot of time wasted, and the result is not quite what you get from analogous, easier procedures, but some of us did it anyways. <laughs> although, so, um, it is a bit complicated, although we, we've improved it a lot since then uh, and removed some of the pain points, but I guess, um, yes, it, it, uh, this person says, continuous publication with Manibot means farewell to the old paradigm of static papers, version control and time stamping, the future is arriving, get on board. Um, so uh, I have a small grant from the Sloan Foundation for this work, and um, yeah, that's allowing us to, to make it more user-friendly um, each week. And uh, a lot of new manuscripts have come out since this was published just a couple weeks ago. And we, we actually have a catalog now 
so you can see papers that have been um, authored using Manibot. And uh, actually, if you want to add a paper to the catalog, you just go to this other GitHub repository, make a pull request, adding the, the like URL of the paper, and then this is all automated. Um, so kind of, I haven't talked about much of the automation aspect, but I think a lot of computational science can be automated in this way where um, you know you have like a certain analysis and if you change a variable the analysis can be rerun and um, therefore you make sure that even the results in your paper are always up to date um, and you always know exactly where they came from because like right now if you look at a paper you can have a value and to know how that value actually got there and whether it's from the latest analysis is um, I guess just a leap of faith a little bit. So future directions a bit. Um, continue learning from head nets, uh, continue open source software and uh, tools to make science more open. Um, as I said, I'm a postdoc now, probably going on the job market in the next <laughs> couple of years, so um, let me know if you know of any good positions. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> asking the students for a job. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, thanks a lot. It's been it's been great to talk to you. Questions? Is anyone doing? Uh, how long are you in Utah? Oh, um, till Sunday, but going to Park City tomorrow. Do people mostly use Python or R here? But does Python hands? R hands? Nice. <laughs> I'd like to see. Yeah, Wendy. Um, so, who's interested in open science? Uh, that like the hiring people or the people with authority or like, like if you're trying to find a job and your specialty is open science. I think. Um, I mean, at least a lot of funders are starting to value this as a big priority. Um, as a funder, I think you see that you get the most sort of value for your, your investment. Uh, I think maybe some universities see an opportunity to take a lead here. Um, I guess I don't, I don't know yet which places value it most. I think you know, a lot of individuals value it um, and, and kind of one problem is once you get to like a committee, maybe the committee values it less. and, and so, I don't know. I haven't been in those committees, but um, I, I see it, it's the area where I see that I can make the biggest impact on science. So I, I love continuing like a lot of my research with the head nets, but um, yeah, I'm very interested in continuing the open science. Stuff too. It seems like you're also interested in disruption, you know? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, I did a study on SciHub, looking at do you know SciHub? It's like a pirate site for papers. Mm -hmm. Uh, Sci-hub.tw, and if you're like off campus, uh, you, you just put in the it, the DOI and it gives you the PDF. Uh, Elsevier sued them, <laughs> but the the woman who makes it is based in Russia, so she doesn't respond to the suits. But anyways, we found that you know <laughs> it contains uh, like 85% of articles in Toll Access Journal. So um, our argument was this is really going to force publishing to change to more open models. Um, and I mean that's something that I think is overdue and good and um, you know my advice to journals is be proactive in the switch but um, it was yeah I liked it to be the disruptor and uh, yeah any other questions well it's fun that you mentioned like you know github and Markdown, because all our students are <coughs> using Jupyter Notebooks, yeah. so they see Markdown cells, and they are using GitHub to, to clone and pull and push and stuff. So. Yeah, that's amazing. I would say, you know, Git, GitHub, Markdown, um, the Notebooks, and Docker, if you learn those things, you're in a great position um, for these fields. It, it seems like it's just growing and growing. It's kind of Anyone in the audience have a suggestion for something he should do while he's in Utah? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Go to the salt flats. Mm. 
I don't know if you've done that. Um, no, no, we need to do it, but yeah. It's a lab, I think it's like an hour and a half drive. I think we should take you guys. But, but, but once you get there, it's cool, but then it's, there's not much to do other than Yeah, no. No, you just stand there and you say, wow. And just take pictures. <laughs> yeah, <but that's> <laughs> pictures. <laughs> and you can walk on it, but it's just, yeah. it's just amazing. Yeah, I think it's hot. It is, it is hot. Antelope Island. Antelope Island. Yes, the Olympic Park while you're in Park City. They have like zip lining and oh, okay. Olympic tube Park. for sliding stuff nice. and all sorts of yeah. activities. And the, and the, the Umatah Mountains are closed. Yeah. If you want to get out, 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 out of the heat. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. All right. Well, thank yeah. you. Thank you. Thanks so much.